白さんそのペンライトください Oh, great. Now they're charging for these stupid things. Hey, isn't the price of the movie ticket more than enough for y'all already? We opened this week with Chizuko stressing out over one of the worst things to ever happen to any kid in school the dreaded parent teacher conference. <laughs> And it was especially bad for her as her grandfather had gone away to an eagle tournament, leaving Chroma as technically her only adult guardian. Well, just look on the bright side, girl. I mean, it can't get any worse than having this dude as your standing daddy. Hey Siri, is it possible to die from cringe? If you think it could be serious, ask me to call emergency services or someone you trust. I was being sarcastic. To be exact, he was Chizuko's homeroom teacher and divorcee father, Masamune. Yeah, him and her mother separated when she was likely still an infant and therefore didn't realize she even had a father until much later in life. In fact, she didn't even realize that her teacher was her biological father until her previous conference where Gramps introduced his former son-in-law to her. That is just all kinds of messed up. And yet, also kind of believable, so it's actually kind of making my head spin. Point is that Chizuko very understandably wanted to hide Chroma's activities from her daddy teacher. Which of course, this idiot could shut up about. However, Masamune was not only cool with this, but as it turned out, he was a fan of the villain. Yeah, being someone prone to bouts of depression, which sorry there dude, he did really enjoy watching a total underdog loser villain like him, as it gave him someone to live vicariously through. Say dude, you wanna help me write some of my scripts for next October? Yeah, needless to say, I got to find this whole setup pretty damn hilarious. Not just for the fact that Masamune was basically the polar opposite of his daughter, in that he was a fanboy of the villain, but I also love his boomer dad energy. You know, my father can't tell the difference between a regular wristwatch and Apple Watch, and uh, yeah, after this, I think I'm kind of glad he's bad with tech. The second segment of the episode opened with us learning about the results of Gramps' Eagle Tournament. Is that the modern equivalent of this? Because, yeah, I think I actually kind of prefer this a lot more. And from there, Chizuko had gotten something in the mail, which turned out to be a card from Fossa Magna, which we certainly saw a lot of last week. Uh, careful there, Chizuko, or else you might turn into a fairy mascot reject, which you really don't want to be one, especially in this economy. Chroma also explained that she kind of needed a physical card, because while there was an app for it, she wouldn't have been able to get it to work on her phone, as she didn't have 5G support. Eh, that stuff is over it. Heck, I actually prefer calling my friends with this old bait right here. Though speaking of outdated tech, Chizuko would end up giving a lost kid a telephone card to help her call her parents. Like again, I actually like old tech, but you really can't expect to teach these kids these days about how to use payphones over a freaking smartphone. Not that it really mattered anyway, as this girl named Kokoa, who was the girl in the background from the first episode, had other plans as after a little hug, she managed to pickpocket Chizuko's other card. The results of her carelessness would become apparent once she got home. As it turned out, she somehow knew all about them, and seemed like she would be another evil replacement from their HQ. However, she just turned out to be a rich, spoiled brat, who had used a card to discover Chizuko's name and home address. She was still aware of the fact that the city was filled with a bunch of clashy magical powers, and was trying to investigate it. Moreover, with the card, she had access to all of Chizuko's magic, and it seemed like she had the upper hand, as she delivered her evil monologue. Some wounds never truly heal, do they? Yeah, I was gonna say that it was a little weird that Chroma of all characters suddenly manned up here after somehow being defeated by the lowly, but then I remembered last week when a close friend of his assaulted him with a similar card. Thus, Kokoa trying to use it likely triggered him, and he tried to save both parties from a similar fallout that fell on both him and Mashima. Fortunately, Chizuko in turn stopped him and took back her card on her own. Good thing too, because hilariously enough, he once again was at his magic usage limit for the month. Well, maybe if you all just upgrade to 6G, then it would be better. 
the third segment, yeah, they're really trying to pack in a lot in this one episode, was another bit with Kokoa and her butler, Ski, who was also in the last segment and just kind of screwing around. Fortunately, she wasn't trying to be a wannabe villainess, and instead was being your typical kid who had lost her precious dolly. Specifically, it was a gift from her father, who was constantly busy at work. Yeah, a bit of a rush backstory for this new character, but it did at least lead to a nice moment for Chroma, who after learning about her circumstances, circumstances tried to help out. And he would prove to be very useful as they quickly found the culprit who turned out to be a dog. They managed to corner it and eventually forced it to give up the doll which turned out to be a jelly catfish which okay I actually kind of like that lame ass pun and yeah that's a pretty cute plushie. Helping someone is somehow an act of evil? Well yeah it actually kind of is with social media these days but still. And from there, and after hilariously fixing up some drainage stitches that they had disassembled to get the doll back, we rather smoothly rolled right into the fourth and final segment of this episode, where the Kumakaijin found a flyer for a Berry Blossom handshake event, because of course magical girls also have to be idols these days. Thanks a lot, Aikatsu! Of course, not even standing with a bunch of creepy otaku was going to stop Chizuko from going to such an event. While that, and she was worried that this sort of out of nowhere event could end up drawing no crowds, so she wanted to go there and draw them herself, but that proved to be unnecessary. And not too surprisingly, it had been organized by Mashiro, but as she learned from him, Kaju was completely unaware of this whole thing. Yeah, wholesomely enough, he was doing this mostly to boost his partner's morale by showing how many fans she had, but I guess he figured that she'd also be too shy to willingly participate in such an event, so he kept it a secret until the last minute, which come on dude, you should at least let her get some hand sanitizer, especially in this post-covid world. That, and he also probably should have set up restrictions against evil generals and the like. As a result, Chroma of course tried to troll her by making her shake hands with her nemesis that did feel a little bit Faustian. <laughs> Moments like this is why I love this stupid stupid show. Hell, it was even topped off by the reveal that Chizuko had actually gotten all of her stalking skills from her dad. Later, Chroma confirmed that just like Mashiro, she kind of underestimated Kaju's popularity and even initially invited him along. In the end though, it of course all just kind of worked out, and the episode ended nicely enough with Chroma offering his partner a handshake that she turned down. <laughs> this was an okayish episode, though a little mixed in areas too. I think the biggest problem was that they tried to stuff what was likely originally four different manga chapters into one, which included the introduction of a few new characters. It got across all they needed to, but it definitely suffered in the pacing as a result. Right off the bat, I will say easily my favorite new character from this episode was Masabune, as I tend to like the boomer dad trope as at least a boomer uncle myself. And even then, it's still a pretty damn hilarious setup to have him both be Chizuko's teacher and a fan of the villain as opposed to the heroine of this story. He might also open up some new story possibilities for Chizuko later, but even if he doesn't, he's still a really entertaining character. Unfortunately, the same can exactly be said for Kokua. I mean, she's not a bad character, but so far we don't know much about her other than that she's a brat who was somehow aware of the unusual magic in the city. They might flesh her out later, but for now, the only thing that was interesting in her segment was Chroma getting triggered by her almost using the card like Mashima did. Worst of all is that it did end up taking away from the final segment, which while still hilarious thanks to the wrist lock punchline, it also could have benefited from a little better pacing to flesh out all the talk about egos and how these heroes and villains were deep down trying to support one another, which you know has kind of been the main theme of the show. Still overall, this is a fine enough episode, again and mostly thanks to our core trio of characters and kind of Masamune. I'll give a little more time to let Kokua cook because right now she felt like a drink that could have used a little more chocolate. Thank you for watching and as always maybe check out some of our other videos on this channel if you're interested. With this year somehow coming to a close soon, yeah I'm just as surprised as you, we're starting to make plans for the next as this also was a very productive year as we experimented with a bunch of new series so we'll definitely try to do the same in 2025. Look forward to whatever really might come next. Until next time, though, for now, my friends, and uh, excuse me, I think I got a call here. Hello? Hello? Uh, yeah, hold on. I think I need to put you on a landline or something.